unfortunate. You, when you do your famous eye house tours, um, it's kind of like a yearly thing too. And I think it's usually happens like after the gala or something like that. But um, can you kind of describe that? Like what brought about like you doing the tours and what are some parts of eye house, like little known secrets that maybe like people don't know of that, um, like in terms of like the architecture or its history that are fun facts that people might not be aware of? Uh, well, you know, I, some years after I retired, um, I guess some of the, the staff that continued on after knew that I had taken an interest in the architectural history of the building because much of the architecture in the building speaks to the founding of iHouse and its mission. And so I spent a lot of time trying to understand why was the house built this way? And what are some of these secret uh, corners and nooks and crannies, what do they mean? right, that most people won't see because they didn't have the chance to do the research. So I'm in the homeroom right now. So this ceiling, which I don't know if you can see it, right, you can't really see the ceiling, but the next time you or alumni come into the homeroom, what I discovered was uh, that like much of the house is inspired by Spanish architecture and Spanish Moorish uh, North African architectural traditions. So the ceiling here in, in the homeroom was inspired by a, an ante room at the cathedral in Toledo. That's one thing that most people don't know. Um, you see that right behind me, that chest? That was one of the earliest, if not here in the very beginning, furnishings of International House. Again, to you will see these kinds of things in Spain today, that chest. There are two of them in, this, in the homeroom. So this is like 70-year-old kind of yeah. artifacts. Basically, 90, 90 years, 90 years old, 90 years old. Um, let me, I don't know if I have the time to do this. Should I do this, the chair? Yeah. Uh, you could probably turn around in it, yeah. So this chair is one of the original chairs from my house, 1930. Now, some of it's been reupholstered, but you, can you see it okay, Chancellor? Uh, you probably have to bring it over to the camera a little bit more. Oh, okay. Let's move this. Okay. Oh, wow. Right. See, it's powerful. So this is the kind of chair you would still see in Spain today. Um, I don't know what, if you remember that um, next to the mail room, there's a, a leather chest right outside the mail room. Think about this for a second. As you're walking up towards the dining room and just past the mail room, there's a big leather chest. Next time you come to the house, you'll see it. Yes. So here's, when you talk about um, you know, secrets of the architecture, when it was decided to create this house with a Spanish Moorish theme, it was in part because of the Spanish influence in California, right? So our architecture is different from the architecture at the University of Chicago and at, at the one near Columbia University and the one in Paris, for example, and the one in Tokyo. But our architecture reflects the history and the fact that you know the Spanish did have a big influence, uh, Spanish culture in California. So Mr. Edmonds, the man who had the idea for International House, came out here and he said, well, you know, we need to decorate the place and furnish the place. My daughter is an interior decorator. I'd like her to go to Spain for a year and come back with ideas on how to furnish the house. Right? This is back in 1928. Wow. She went to Spain and she lived in a building called International House. I think it was at the University of Madrid. That International House was inspired by the International House in New York City. Uh, and the doctor to the King of Spain had experienced it. He had visited it and he said, after he saw the New York I House, he said, I think that I want to have a International House in Spain. So he had one with his money built at the University of Madrid, which the daughter of Harry Edmonds uh, lived in for a year and she came back and brought all these ideas back and including that chest that you will look for when you come back to I house, mm -hmm. right outside the mail. That chest comes from Spain. I would often say this, and that unfortunately that international house uh, in Spain in Madrid was destroyed during the Spanish Civil War in the 30s, unfortunately. So I have often said, I would like this to be one of my legacies. I've often said to the Spanish students, put your hand on that chest and promise me that if you become a wealthy person one day, you will rebuild that international house that was destroyed during the Spanish Civil War, okay? 
maybe you could do that for me. When you come back and you meet some Spanish students, have them put their hands on that, that chest and say, you should rebuild that international house in Spain. I house all over the world. That's it. That's it. So, um, you know, and other, also the uh, ceiling in the auditorium. That ceiling is a type of ceiling you will see in various religious institutions in Spain, mostly today churches, but it reflects a Spanish, a Moorish Muslim uh, architectural feature. So as you know, some churches became uh, mosques and actually some mosques became synagogues and vice versa, you know, kind of how, how history goes here. So I remember reading an article about uh, recently a, um, a religious institution in Spain that had the same, I have the picture of it. When I meet you, I'll show you the picture. The same ceiling as in the auditorium. That institution had once been a church, once been a mosque, and once been a synagogue. What better symbol for us? Wow. That's the ceiling in the auditorium. Combining uh, all different, like kind of like religious, cultural aspects. Exactly. So the patio, right? The patio. Most people don't realize that the patio, the inner patio next to the dining room, right? The part of the dining room? That patio is with olive trees. That's not an accident. Olive trees are a symbol of what? Is it peace? peace? That's it. Peace this is all very well thought out. The arches, this is all very common, the arches, right? Um, the arches so basically, in Iron. So basically everything in terms of the architecture of Eye House, that, this, it was all intentional. Like in yes. terms of like the building, in terms of like the interior, how the ceilings looked, like the chandeliers and all of that, th this was all like kind of intentional. Was there anything done perhaps by accident or maybe like a change made later on in the renovations that um, I House, like the people designing I House like wanted to change, whoever was in charge of the board at that time? At, during my time, there was always a very strong commitment by the architects, the engineers, our board of directors to preserve as much as possible. Before my time, um, the dining room was not as big as it is today. So when you walk into the dining room, you see those beautiful chandeliers, right? It's kind of dark, a little bit darker. And then there's another dining room adjacent, which is closer to the outdoor garden. Not, not the patio, but the outdoor garden. And it's much lighter, especially it's lighter at night. That was added after the Second World War. So as you know, um, International House went out of business for three years during the war, and this was occupied by the Navy who were training to go to war. Um, so when I House reopened, they realized that they had to accommodate more students. So they had to double up ro many rooms. It, originally, it was only 450 rooms for all single students. When at the end of the war, you had GIs returning home, you had students from other countries who wanted to come to the United States and and get their education here. So they expanded the occupancy to close to 600. Well, in order to feed 600 people, you had to enlarge the dining room. So they added that dining room, which is much lighter, if you think about it. Um, and it wasn't in the architectural spirit of the original dining room. It, was, it, was, it had to be done quickly. So it was very kind of clipped and uh, practical. It wasn't really inspired. During my time, the House Committee uh, decided let's do a partial renovation to make it a little bit more compatible with the original dining room. So what you've seen today is a little bit closer with the lighting. But what's interesting is it's still much lighter. Now think back to this. Yeah, at night it's lighter. You walk into the dining room and the original dining room is much darker, the wooden beams. The other dining room is lighter. Now think about this. When you were eating here, did you ever think that in general there was a tendency for students from Asia to be living, to be eating in the lighter dining room? I, I did notice a kind of like a separation that more students tended to sit on like the right side where all the windows were than I guess right. other. So, I, you know, many people ask me, why is it that there's this tendency, of course there were always exceptions, yeah. for students particularly of Asian background to be eating on the right side. Now, of course, you know, with all of the interchange at iHouse, people also needed to re, re, uh, confirm their identities and be with people that are, they were comfortable with. So it's understandable that people would sit with their own nationality. 
Uh, we tried during our time to have what they call language tables where people would want to learn the language from other countries. That was pretty successful actually during my time. But on the other hand, it was the students who sought out people who were different that got the most out of I House. Yes, it was normal for people to gather and reconfirm their own identities. But people over and over asked me, why is it that there's this tendency for the Asians to be on the light side? I finally got the answer. Nobody could explain it to me. A student who lived here, who is now the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in mm -hmm. Shanghai, his mother, one of his parents is Caucasian, his, the other parent is Chinese. He said, I understand this, Joe. In Asian cultures, people, when they're eating dinner, have bright lights. Even if you go to Chinese restaurants here in the Bay Area that cater primarily to Chinese audiences, very bright lights. Yeah. And they will tell you, yeah, we like to look at our food. We like to see it. <laughs> the way the food is arranged. Now you think about it, people from other countries tended to associate dinner with more subdued lights. When you eat dinner, you know, do you want a lot of bright lights on it? It's how you're brought up. So unconsciously, people couldn't explain why they were sitting where they were sitting. Not in every case, of course. I'm talking about general tendencies. But later on, when I interviewed many Asian students, they said, oh, yeah, right. I feel, oh, I want to see my food, how it's presented, what it looks like. And many of the other students would say, well, I was brought up when our dinners were more subdued like. So unconsciously, this gentleman, who was the product of a, an interracial, intercultural couple, that's the value of having connections with other people. You have a bigger vision to understand these things. Okay, and so um, now I kind of want to know, um, <laughs> thank you so much for like describing kind of like uh, touching on the history, touching on like um, cultural um, perceptions, also like things that you've learned, things that students have learned from you. Um, and now I also, um, and since you already mentioned like earlier on in, in, in the interview, um, how you've been like coping uh, during the pandemic, I kind of want to know what are some things that you've been up to since leaving iHouse, since leaving your executive director role? Um, things that you've been working on, um, either projects, talks that you've done, um, if you could just describe those. Yeah, I think the most important thing is that uh, my wife and I wanted to stay in touch in other ways with people who from other backgrounds because they have been our great teachers, as I said earlier. So I did begin uh, mentoring refugees uh, who were coming to this country and were uh, the organization I worked with was basically, these were extremely highly skilled people. Uh, they were refugees, but they didn't have the skills to look for jobs, the cultural skills, because when you look for a job in every country, it's different. How the resume is presented, whether you have a cover letter or not, how you handle a cover letter is different, how you present yourself in an interview is different. So for many years, I spent a lot of time mentoring uh, refugees from all over the world in, in how to secure employment in this country, how to tailor your resume, tailor your cover letters, uh, interview, getting questions, for example, you're never used to. And in that process, I continue to learn more. So for example, many students from uh, Asia, Africa, the Middle East tend to be much more group oriented than we are in this country. Like the group is more important than the individual. That's <laughs> with, You're with very individualistic in the US. Right, so you know, when, when they would be asked the question, tell us about your, um, your most significant accomplishments. So they wouldn't start the answer with I, they'd start the answer with we. So I'm asking, I'm interviewing you, Chancellor, and I say, well, what are your greatest accomplishments? Now, if you were a person from one of these collectivistic, more collectivistic countries, you would start, well, we did and we accomplished. And I would say, but I'm asking you. And they would say, but I couldn't have done it without other people. And which reminds me of this wonderful story about um, an anthropologist who did an experiment in Zambia and said um, to 10 children, I'm going to put these beautiful treasures, food and uh, special treasures 100 yards away and we're going to have a race. And the one who gets there first gets all of it. Ready, set, go. So when they start running, they all start running hand in hand, together. 
And he asked them afterwards, why, how come you didn't, one of you didn't try to win the race? And they said, because if I won the race, the others would feel badly. So we all want to participate. We all want to participate, which is kind of what's behind we, what are your accomplishments? And many people from these countries also, particularly Asian cult countries, are taught to be modest, not to point to yourself. So if you would say, I, for example, I, had, I was coaching a woman from Nepal and she said, um, I said to her, you, have, you know, at the bottom of our resumes, you have special distinct, distinctions, things that you've done that you're proud of. Nothing was there, but she had been a, a major uh, TV anchor in Nepal. I said, how come there are no distinctions there? Have you had any? And she looked uncomfortable. So I knew immediately that's because she didn't want to brag. Well, finally, you know, finally, she was selected to escort Hillary Clinton in Nepal because yeah. she was that much respected. She was asked to be the translator in Nepal for Colin Powell, our former Secretary of State, right? Uh, when he came to visit the King of uh, Nepal. Did she put that on her resume? No, she didn't want to point to herself. So these are the kinds of things that I would learn or I would learn why did many of these people from these particular countries bow their heads when the interviewers were speaking to them? They wouldn't look in the eyes. So American interviewers thought, oh, they don't have any confidence. They have no self-confidence. Wrong. I'm showing you respect by not looking you in the eyes. So that was one of the things. And then I developed a series of workshops for their staff um, to try to understand more of the dynamics of different ways of interviewing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then I started doing intercultural training for various organizations. Why is it that you're not communicating effectively? What's stopping you from your succeeding as a multinational, multicultural team? And then I thought, well, let me see if I can start to put some of this together. And that's when I started working. Maybe it was about 2012 on this book, Perception and Deception, right? In which, as you know, there's a chapter about my time in the Peace Corps. There's a chapter about my time at I House, And then, you know, in the world of business, in the world of religion, in the world of um, uh, immigrants. And I just found that doing that book kept me in touch with people who were continuing to teach me that their stories were teaching me. And my publishers suggested that we develop a set of exercises so that they could use the stories as a base of trying to understand other cultures. So that, the book, Teaching Classes on Intercultural Communication, Working with Refugees, um, and now during the, this time of the pandemic, I'm trying to see to what extent my own perceptions and what I've learned over time might be somewhat useful uh, to people during this time, because I, I firmly believe that, particularly when people are frightened and people are living in uncertain times, they often want to come to quick conclusions. If they're not sure about what's happening, they want to create a reality that gives them a sense of who they are, right, or, or what's happening. And um, so even on, you know, when you look at television today, you have cable channels that all have different narratives. They're not talking to each other, they're talking to their base. And those, the, whether it's a Fox News channel on the extreme right or MSNBC, which tends to be towards the left, they tend to be talking to their own audiences. They're not talking in civilized ways or dignified, respectful ways with each other, which in my mind increases uh, polarization. So I did uh, recently call upon some of the blessings and teachings from I House and my time in other countries to write an article called Unmasking of Pandemic's Deceptions. So you will recall, we all recall so much that uh, in the beginning when it, would, when it was thought, oh, this virus comes from China, therefore some politicians, we know who they are, fueled the idea that, oh, this is coming from the Chinese. So you know, here in the Bay Area and other parts of the United States, people uh, who look Asian, Chinese, whatever, with their Japanese, they've been assaulted spit upon, yelled at, right? So my dentist, and this is, this is uh, explained in the article, my dentist is American uh, who, uh, with Chinese heritage. She told me that her mother had a cough. Her cough, which went back 15 years, was because of a lung operation. That cough came from a lung operation and she coughs to this day. 
in the context of the coronavirus, all of her friends in the community who know her, they knew what the cough meant. Everybody else, whether Chinese or otherwise, get away from me, because they thought she was going to infect him. So the poor woman had to isolate herself in her apartment. She didn't even want to go into her community because yes, people who knew her knew why she was coughing. Other people thought she's going to infect us with the virus, right? So you asked me about Proverbs. Once bitten by a snake, one is forever afraid of the mere sight of a rope. If you are bitten by a snake, anytime you see anything that looks like a snake, whether it's just a rope, you, you have a, an anxiety attack. Well, Mark Twain once said, when the cat sat on a hot stove, it never sat on a cold stove again. Which is also about, if I have a bad experience with X person from X ethnicity, that is going to, unfortunately, in times like this, even more create fear and hostility, which is why I think not only with the coronavirus, but also with racial issues in this country, the police in this country. Oh, this person must be X. I had this kind of experience with this black person, therefore that black person must be. I had this kind of an experience with a policeman, therefore that policeman must be. So, you know, at times like this, people need to have an anchor. So unfortunately, the, they create their own anchors. So you asked me for a proverb. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna. Yeah, I was gonna get to that question too. Since like your book, it has proverbs from people right. uh, and nations from like around the world. I did want to know, in terms of the context of the time now, like you know, with the COVID nineteen pandemic, with um, uprisings over systemic racism, racial injustice, and even like now that people are spending life in quarantine in some places, like what would what would you feel is a um, appropriate or um, what is it a relevant proverb for the times of today? Well, I mean, it's difficult because people are so afraid that they, they just kind of fall back on the irrationality so often. So, um, you know, I've often said, and this is very difficult advice to absorb when you're frightened and you, you have uncertainty facing you, to kind of fall back and pause, what else could this mean? Or are you just having some kind of a gut reaction? What all of this has taught me over time is, when we are encountering people who are different, we have to be aware of our filters, what is stopping us from seeing a bigger picture. When you look at me, do you see me? Or my favorite proverb at all that everybody of all, that everybody at I House teased me about. The stranger sees only what he or she knows. They don't see what they don't know. And that's one of the lessons of what we're living in now. And we need some calmness, we need some, we need some effort to what else could this mean? We need the lessons of I House. We need to stop living in segregated neighborhoods, segregated schools. We need to take the spirit and vibrancy of what this place is about and help people to start living together as opposed to, oh, yeah, sure. I have X, Y people working in my company. You're not living with them. So that's, um, you know, I house is the answer. We need to have, create I houses everywhere. And one of the tragedies right now, and, and we know why I house has to close right now to yeah, protect I'm safety. Uh, but its spirit and the people who've lived here and, and have been imbued with its lessons and its uh, teachings have to, in their own way, bring that forth in their own lives wherever they're living. And you know, to stay in touch with the the many people that they met and became friends with uh, at I house over time. Yeah, and that does transition to my like final um, questions coming <laughs> coming along. Um, it's a two it's a two part one. A like, what were your thoughts um, on I House closing as per the fall um, and for possibly the upcoming school year? And um, B, what what do you feel is the future of I House? Well, my thoughts were kind of encapsulated by one one former resident who wrote to me and said, <clears throat> "Prudent but heartbreaking." He made the right decision to protect people, but it's heartbreaking to see an institution that is perhaps more necessary today in its principles and what it, how it can transform many people in the way they look at the world and look at each other, that's heartbreaking. 
So it's future, hopefully when this virus subsides, that it will come back with greater vigor, more relevance than ever, and that it will hopefully spur not only the creation of other international houses, because this is, for the most part, a concept at universities, right? I think we need to start doing some co-housing. I think the international house could basically start to embrace what happens afterwards, aside from the fact that you're going to go out and have good, these values that you've learned at iHouse. What are you going to do in your communities to help to get people to do things together, to discover their common humanity, as opposed to, you know, you can have all of the conversations you want about ethnic differences, racial differences, injustice, it doesn't stop until people get to know each other as human beings. And as I said earlier, in my view, you cannot open the mind until you touch the heart. Yeah, absolutely. Those are um, great um, ending words. Um, lastly, <laughs> I've probably been saying lastly a lot. Um, there's <laughs> recent alumni, um, some who had to leave early because like back in March, like once the pandemic and the pandemic restrictions started coming down. I, I do want to know what is your message or what message you have um, to the iHouse community, whether it's like current residents who are there now who will be like leaving soon um, and those who recently left and just the broader iHouse Berkeley community in general, if there's a message you have. Well, let me, let me kind of combine it in two steps. One step number one is I want to say that I was moved to see that while this decision was very painful to take by the board of directors here. They took it with, I thought, great compassion, meaning that they weren't simply asking students who are living here, time to move out, as they unfortunately did at another international house, without any plan to help them, or students who had enrolled for the fall. So as you may have seen, there is actually a plan to help the students who are living here now and students who had applied and been accepted to live here in the fall to find alternate housing. I found that moving. We have not forgotten you. We know that you may not have a place to go right now. We are here to help you find alternate housing. That moved me deeply. Now with regard to you know, the future, I mean, I, I think when I was thinking about your question, uh, Chancellor, I went back to, um, what did I house mean to me and my wife? And so if you'll forgive me, I thought I came across something that I thought kind of encapsulated um, what the house meant to us and what I hope it will continue to mean for so many of the residents from the past and those who will be here in the future. So if you would indulge me, um, Donna, my wife, and I had the great pleasure and privilege of welcoming thousands of students from around the world who came to call iHouse home. A place where countless residents told us they never felt like foreigners and where we saw stereotype after stereotype and prejudice upon prejudice crumble because of simple human acts of kindness. Thus, Donna and I became students ourselves once again challenged again and again by notions of what is normal, confronted by the limitations of the familiar, reminded over and over that we do not know what we do not know, and that discovery is often about two people seeing the same thing, right? Looking at the same thing, but seeing something different. At iHouse, as one alumna observed, Ethnocentric perspectives are dismantled and residents come together not as images on travel posters, but face to face and in the process are bent, hurt, delighted, enlightened, and in the end changed. Our years at iHouse <clears throat> remind us that someone once said, the world is a book and those who don't travel read only a page. Because of our iHouse journey, the readings were many, they were rich, and their messages of discovery and friendship remain with us wherever we go. So my hope is that those experiences from former residents and those residents to come will remain messages that are embedded in their viscera and will have an impact on all they touch in the years ahead. Wow. I, I think that's a great way to end it and kind of like um, end this great conversation that we've had in this discussion like 
with you sharing your knowledge too about I house its history and um, of course I, I can understand like it means different things to different people but I guess like the main goal of it is of course like you know cultural understanding um, hopefully hopefully getting a chance sense of unity while you're there but um, yeah understanding the person who um, you probably had different notions about or you might, might not have known too so I guess it's a it's an educational and learning experience for I, I at least I hope for whoever happens to walk through those doors just as it was for me just as it was for you just as it is for like the staff and everyone is there so thank you so much for um, saying that and um, I it's always best for me to end with any final thoughts anything else that you have to say <laughs> I want to thank you for taking all the time to prepare your questions and to think about this and to go through some of the history I mean it's a long history so um, once again much appreciation to you Chancellor. and thank you thank you so much